Come on, can we just give Jesus a big hand clap in this house? He's worthy. I'm really, really grateful to be with you today. Uh, I love getting to meet new people, but I had actually heard of your pastor and was eager to meet him, and then we happened to have the opportunity to play golf together, and what better place to seek the Lord's face than on the golf course, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, can we just give your pastor, uh, Pastor Scott and his wife Renee, a big hand clap? This is a... This is a blessed house. It's a blessed community, and I'm really, really grateful for your friendship. I'm really grateful to be invited into this space. I don't take it lightly, so thank you so much for allowing me. I'm excited to preach God's Word today. A little bit uh, about myself. Pastor Scott did an incredible job telling our story, but we do. We hail from Louisiana, and uh, it, it's in our blood. Uh, we drank the water, so we can't help it. I've got a Cajun wife. Uh, Nicole, who's here with me today. I've got Dawson and Edwin. And then our three-year-old is in the kids' ministry. And I got to visit with the kids' ministry before, uh, before service. And I said, thank you so much, and I'm sorry. And, uh, but he'll do fine. He, he, he loves kids' ministry. Um, uh, we come from Shreveport, Louisiana. I do. Uh, Nicole comes from the south part of the state. We met in college. And when we met, uh, we felt like God was bringing us together for a purpose, for a ministry purpose. We had both sensed the call of the Lord in our hearts from, from young ages. And then when we met, we, we just knew that the Lord had something specific for us as a married couple. And so uh, that, that over the last 13 years has developed into a call to plant a church. And so in the fall, like Pastor Scott said, in the fall of next year, uh, September 22nd is actually our uh, aim to, to launch. September 22nd, we'll be in the TCU area of Fort Worth. We're planting Tove City Church. And so if you think about us, pray for us. Uh, but I'll tell you what's so special and unique, like Pastor Scott said, the kingdom connections that God is interested in building. We're, we're not building our own things. When we, when we plant churches, they're not, they're, it's not like the business world. We're not planting entities and organizations that are built around people. God is at work doing his work. And so I'm eager as a church planter, as a pastor, to build connection, to build community together. So I love being here. This place is special to us, Lake Country Church. Of course, uh, our kids go to Lake Country Christian School. And so I've been eager to connect here. So thank you for uh, being part of an answered prayer for us. We love this house, and I'm really grateful to share God's Word. Are you ready for God's Word today? Uh, if you've got your Bibles with you, and of course we'll have it on the screen, um, it's Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 is the passage from which today's message will be uh, coming from. Mark 8, verse 22 through 26. It's a familiar passage, um, and, and you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear the words, and if you've been in church any, any time, any length, you've probably heard someone preach on this message, or at least you've, um, you've or on this passage, or at least you've, uh, you've heard the story. But I'm hoping that today what we can do is take in this passage and let it speak to our hearts. Uh, and, and to me, it's really a life framing message. It's something that, uh, for, for me, what's happened is uh, I've, w I've been in church, I grew up in church, and, and, and in my life I've been eager to do things for God. You know, God sets your heart on fire as, as a Christian, and you want to serve Him, but, but if we're not careful, what can happen is our own interpretation of what God wants is what we begin to go after, but really what God wants to do is He wants to shape our hearts, shape our lives, and do His his work through us. And it may sound like a slight nuance, but I believe that if we'll allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the life of Jesus uh, to shape our lens, to shape our hearts, what will, be, what will begin to happen is our Christian life will feel less forced and it will feel more like flow, like the Spirit of God flowing through us. And we won't find ourselves in a frustrating place, we'll find ourselves in a thriving place as we see the life of Jesus, as we see the Spirit of God himself activating our lives and flowing through us for his glory. So if you've got your Bibles, Mark chapter 8, verse 22, I'm going to read it together. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV, and it reads like this. And they came to Bethsaida. 
And some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and he said, and I love this honesty, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him home to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. I want to speak to you over the next few minutes with this thought in mind. Blind in Bethsaida. Can you say that with me? Blind in Bethsaida. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your people. Thank you for your word. Thank you for caring about us enough to preserve a canon of scripture that would reveal your character, your nature, and by your spirit would speak to our hearts and activate our lives. Lord, I pray that today you would use your word to open the eyes of our hearts to see things the way that you see them so that you would shape the way that we live for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. come on, can we just give Jesus one more big hand clap in this house for his word? Well, I don't know about you, but um, as, this may just go over everybody's head, but have you ever seen those post-wisdom teeth extraction videos? Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? A few of you? They're, they're the silly little videos that people post on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, whatever it, whatever, whatever it may be, and it, it goes viral, and, and it's someone recovering from having their wisdom teeth out. And what they're recovering from is the um, anesthesia and, and how it's wearing off, and it really just makes people loopy, and they say the wildest things. I love those videos. So it tells you a little bit about it. I just laugh till I cry watching those videos and watch and hearing what people say. And uh, recently, um, I won't show the videos, but we had our own little opportunity to have a post wisdom uh, uh, post wisdom teeth extraction opportunity. My wife Nicole had hers out, and uh, we did get some glorious home footage. And again, I won't share that, but um, it reminded me of when I got my wisdom teeth out when I was 18 years old. And uh, needless to say, I'm still recovering. It's, it's been a long journey back to wisdom. But um, I, I, I don't remember the surgery, thank God. It was a, a good enough anesthesia uh, to keep me under until they could perform the surgery. But what I do remember is waking up from that surgery. I, I remember, have you ever had surgery, anybody? Come on. Uh, you've, surgery's strange because you, you, it feels like you just went to sleep and then you're waking up. And so there I am on the table and I, the nurses are, are there and they're saying, hey, Derek, it's time to wake up. And I'm trying, you know, like it's weird. I'm not not trying to wake up. And, and, but they just seem super eager to wake me up and, and I'm trying. It's just weird. And uh, I'm there, and they're saying, Derek, you got to wake up. It's time to wake up. The surgery went well, and, and I'm still trying. They're like, Derek, you've got to open your eyes. You've got to open your eyes. And I'm trying to open my eyes. And um, they're, they're, you know, they're giggling. All I can muster up is, is opening my mouth as wide as I can, trying to see. And they think it's hilarious, and I'm terrified. The thought that went through my mind is that instead of extracting these wisdom teeth, this doctor has proceeded to extract my eyeballs. Now, when you're under anesthesia, things like that run through your mind. But this little exchange went on, went on and on, and finally, um, right before I just hit panic, my eyes pop open, and to my relief, the the wisdom teeth had come out and not my eyeballs. I was really grateful for that. But, but what I thought about in that moment and what I've thought about since, and it served as an illustration for me, is I am so grateful for sight. I am so grateful to be able to see. 
There, there's this movement right now, and it's, and it's like a darkness movement. I don't know if you've seen it, but people will spend a number of days blindfolded, and what it does is it gives people the opportunity to kind of um, just start over with sight. And it's a very emotional, um, it's an emotional recovery process. You, you take the blindfold off after a few days, and you realize just how beautiful everything is around you when you can see. And I believe that we need our sight refreshed and adjusted because the truth of the matter is, while while not all of us have experienced physical blindness, we've all experienced not being able to see. And not being able to see is not good. Now you know this. What do you and I say um, when we don't understand something? We go, um... I don't know. Anybody just not ever understood something, or is it just me? There's plenty of opportunities for me. Uh, I don't follow. I don't have, like, the same thinking or something, or it's just ADD. But um, some, sometimes people will be telling me something. I'm like, I love your energy, but I'm not following the story. You know, and it's just missing me, and I'm missing it. It happens a lot with Nicole and me. She's explaining something. I'm like, I don't get it. And then finally it hits me, and my response is what? Oh, I see. We, we've all had this type of response. We've all had, we've all been in the dark per se. But my Bible tells me that what Jesus has come to do is that Jesus has come to give sight to those who cannot see. And, and I love how it's presented in Scripture. Of course, you've got the prophecy that Jesus fulfills, that he's bringing sight to blind eyes. But even in the message that Jesus is preaching from the very beginning of his public ministry, you find it in Matthew chapter 4, and I'll read it briefly. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And really quickly, what repent means is, is not just turn from your sin or else. What it actually is, is a, a deeper concept that comes from the word metanoia. It's a Greek word that means to change the way that you think. Or you could put it this way, change the way that you see. You see, Jesus has come to change the way that we think and to change the way that we see. And what that does, it empowers us to live a life of response, a life of following Jesus based on the work that he's done to open our eyes. And so you could put it another way. Jesus wants to shape the way you see so that he can shape the way you live. That's what I want to talk about over the next few minutes. And so in Mark chapter 8, let's take a look at three areas that Jesus wants to change the way that we see. The first is this. The first area I want to point out is passions. Passions. Jesus wants to shape the way that you see your passions. Look at Mark chapter 8, verse 22 through 26 again. It says, and they came to Bethsaida. Now, it's important for me to point out Bethsaida here because of what was going on historically at this time. You see, when Jesus shows up on the scene in this town, uh, and and by the way, Bethsaida is the combination of two words. It's the word Beth and Seda, which means the house of fishing or hunting, because this place for such a long time had been beautifully defined by the tradesmanship and the craftsmanship and the, the working industry of that area, and it was fishing and hunting. And it was, a, it was a successful enough place at one time to be named after this trade of fishing and hunting. But by the time that Jesus shows up on the scene, this place has fallen into turmoil. This place has been overrun with an enemy uh, country, and they have begun to oppress these people. And what's happened is it's ignited flames of intense passion within the community. And it should have been. When, when things blow up in our face, or uh, it can be good or bad, a good thing happens or a bad thing happens, what can happen to us is our passions are inflamed. And Jesus shows up here. Verse 22 continues, and it says, And some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. Verse 23 says, 
and he took him by the hand and he led him out of the village. Here's where I want to go with you. Um, it's important for me to tell you that Jesus takes the blind man out of the village as it pertains to our passions because Jesus wants to give us a perspective and, and a right perspective on passions. It isn't that Jesus doesn't want you to be passionate. And it isn't that Jesus doesn't want to use your passions for his glory. But what can happen because passions tend to grip us at an identity level is that our passions can turn into idols. And Jesus understands in order for us to operate his way, he's got to be the one on the throne of our lives. And so what he does with this blind man is he takes the blind man out of this village to perform a miracle on his eyes. Now, whatever um, has a grip in your life of passion, sometimes it's career, sometimes it's politics, sometimes, and I'm, all of these things are good. A career is good. Politics are necessary. Uh, Christian people should be incredibly engaged in what's going on in the socioeconomics and the governmental aspects of our world. We should have influence, and so I'm, I'm here to tell you that God wants you to be passionate about the things he's called you to and given you influence over. But if we're not careful, those things, we can be sucked in to the chaos that can be stirred up in passion. And so Jesus takes this blind man out of the village to do work on his eyes, but the Lord wants to take us out of the village of passion so that we can get along with him and capture his heart and then re-enter the stage of influence that he's given us. It's important for us to understand that Jesus is not trying to take your passion away, but what happens in the kingdom of God is Jesus will never, he'll, he'll, never, um, he'll never sacrifice his purpose for your passion. Jesus takes the blind man out of the village, like I said, to work on his eyes, and he wants to take us out of the village to do work on our hearts. Friends, if you and I don't get a grip on our passions, our passions will have a grip on us. And anything that has a grip on our identity other than Jesus will serve as idolatry in our lives. Um, I want to do just a riff here on this word idolatry. Um, God, God has especially when he puts his spirit in our hearts, he awakens our minds. He does beautiful things from the inside out, and he gives us new ideas. For if we're not careful, what can happen is instead of possessing ideas, they belong to us because of God, ideas have a tendency to possess us. And if ideas possess us, then that idea has taken control of us. That's, that's where we get this um, word ideology. And ideology is an idea that doesn't start as dangerous, but when it becomes a possessive idea, the Lord wants to relinquish you from that. He wants to take you away from that so it can have the right place. You see, whatever your passion is, God has probably given you that passion. But when, when that passion begins to serve your own purposes, it's become idolatrous. But what can happen and is so powerful for God's people is when God's purpose is the very thing that we live for, which is to understand that you're his child and that your purpose in life is not to fulfill your passion, but your purpose in life is to bring God glory. When, you're, when it becomes clear to your heart and your mind that your job as a Christian is to bring God glory with your life, everything that you're passionate about will begin to flourish. He wants to do work on our eyes, but it's going to take him, it's going to take some alone time with the Lord so that he can shape that aspect of your 
life. He wants us to step away with him. He wants us to ground our identities in him. I, I, I've got an illustration. I've had the, the privilege to, to, to lead a lot of people. I've, I've, been, I've had the opportunity to oversee large parts of Christian organizations and churches and, and hundreds of employees. And um, one thing I've noticed in the church world, but it can happen in any industry, is that when we become passionate about a calling, it can be very exciting. Uh, and, and we step into these callings, we step into uh, these things we're passionate about, and, and, and we, what would we say? We, we give ourselves to these things. And, and we, don't, we don't say it that way. We know we belong to God, but over time, what can happen is that we, as we give ourselves to the things we feel called to, we can lose ourselves to the things we feel called to. And God has never designed us to give away parts of ourselves that were specifically just meant for Him. I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a job where it started out great, but you begin to lose pieces of yourself. It started out just fitting it into your calendar and scheduling your, your family events and everything fit really nicely, but it began to take over. What begins to happen? That thing that was a gentle passion and a calling from the Lord has now taken over, and we would never say that we're idol worshiping, but it's become idolatrous in our lives. Friends, people rarely choose to worship idols, idolatry and demonology is so sneaky. It sneaks up on you. And when you find yourself in these positions of giving pieces of yourself away, it's time for the Lord to draw you out of the village and restart. Here's the unfortunate thing about life and ministry, even being a pastor, is that we can gain the whole world of ministry and lose our souls. We can start out with great intentions and calling and passion. But if we lose pieces of ourself along the way, what will end up happening is we'll burn out, we'll come to the end of our rope, and we'll be ineffective. Friends, I'm not calling us away. The Lord's not calling us away so that we'll be ineffective and not involved. We're not, we're not called to be, we're, we're, we're called to be in but not of. We're not called to be away from. God has called us to be active pers- participants in what, what he's doing in the earth. But it's what he's doing in the earth. He, here's what will take place. If you and I will buy into purpose overriding passion, you and I will b- work into our lives a regular opportunity to to come away with the Lord. A, on a daily basis, just going, Lord, I belong to you. My, my goal in life are not my passions. My goal in life is bringing glory to my Father. And what will end up happening is you'll never become a fragmented person. The Lord will begin to remind you, hey, you're losing yourself in that thing. And, and as you do that, what happens is instead of just bringing a piece of your life to your passion, you'll bring the whole thing. When you sink your identity into Jesus, you've actually got all of you to bring to the table. That's what God wants for the Christian church. I believe that when we sink our identities into Jesus, the Christian church will come alive. When we make his purpose the thing that overrides our passion, we'll begin to see effectiveness again in the church, in the body of Christ in our day. And I want to be a part of that. Now, Whether we like it or not, Jesus is going to do his work. And he's going to do it his way. Look at verse 23. It says this, and when he had spit on his eyes. Now, I don't know about you, um, but that's gross. You know, and I'm not making fun of Jesus. He had his purposes. He had his reasons. And I'm not even saying that I'm right about why he did that. And there's, there's debate and, and conversation about what, what that means. But, but it's spit, you know. And uh, the disciples um, had to have been like, okay, all right. We thought, you know, the people are like, ah, Jesus, do something. And he's like, watch, I will. And he just spits. 
he spits. I don't know about you, but have you ever been so passionate about something and so desirous for God to do something, and you're praying about it, and you're pressing in about it, and you're just going, Lord, move, and he shows up and he spits on the thing. I've been there, and I've been like, Jesus, you're doing it wrong. But God has a purpose, and God will not be co-opted for your thing. God will not co-opt his influence for your passion. He will step in and do things his way, and he wants us to realize that this is his show. He wants us, he's been so kind enough to partner with us anyway. Won't we let, it, won't we let him do it his way? Jesus doesn't let our passions get in the way of his purpose. Let's see things his way. The second thing is this, power. Jesus wants to open our eyes to see power his way. Look what it says um, in verse 22. We'll go back. It says, some people brought to him. Notice the language there. Some people brought to him a blind man. And then what did they do? They begged him to touch him. Okay, so I, I, we can look at this and go, man, what, what sweet people. They want their friend to be healed, and maybe that is their intention, but we do have to keep in mind the turmoil of the day. This is an oppressed people. They feel like potentially Jesus uh, could overthrow the government that has been oppressing them, and anything Jesus can do or anything that they can get Jesus to do to get him more influence, to get Jesus to do things their way, is going to work out, and, and they'll have a new king, and they'll overthrow the enemy and all these things. So notice what they do, and notice who's doing what. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged Jesus to heal him. I want you to see that it wasn't the blind man begging Jesus. It was the people that were so desperate to see God move that they met Jesus on their own terms and brought Jesus a blind man. Now Jesus, in his love and kindness and who he is, his character and nature, does not disappoint. But look at the power dynamics here. It goes on to say, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Notice the harshness of power-hungry people, passionately desperate people to see something happen. And then notice the gentleness in the midst of that about how God moves, about how Jesus moves. It's a, it's a stark contrast that even in the midst of a society that has gone rogue and, and feels like there's no point of return, Jesus doesn't step in frantic and go, okay, I'll heal him. He's gentle. He's kind, and instead of dragging a blind man off out of the village, he says, hey, will you take my hand? Friends, maybe today this is an opportunity for you to just evaluate where you feel thrown around. Maybe today you feel like the church has thrown you around, and, and all you've experienced at every turn is just hurt and brokenness, and uh, you, you've maybe even lost hope on, on people or society or the church or, or your life or your career or the country or whatever it may be. This is an opportunity for us to see that Jesus is not someone who's just going to come into your life and jerk you around some more. Sometimes we're looking for a big operation to take place when really what Jesus is doing is he's stepping in with gentleness and kindness and lowliness and humility and say, he says, I see all the chaos. I want to draw you out of it. My power works differently. You see, desperation for earthly power and the operation of God's power are two different things. It isn't that God is against power. In fact, God is powerful. And as we look at Scripture, what we see is that God himself is the one who gives people power. But the way we view power and how you gain power and how you use power all matter to God. And it has to do with the way that you treat God people. I want to uh, give a, a short little illustration that comes from scripture. Matthew 20 is where one of the, uh, one of the best 
tellings of this comes from. But what we have in Matthew chapter 20 uh, is, is a mom of a couple of the disciples. And man, I love this story because I have this picture of, in my mind of the disciples. And they, they're probably young men, most of them, maybe even older teenagers, young adults. But they're young enough, especially James and John, for their mom to be very involved in their life. And so if you can imagine a group of ragtag men who, uh, they're, they're not quite sanctified yet, if you will. Um, I imagine they picked on one another when Jesus wasn't looking. And, and when he walked up, they'd be like, shh, shh, he's coming, he's coming. Well, this was, a, this was terrible for James and John. Jesus, I mean, uh, James and John's mom comes and comes to Jesus and is like, Jesus, I got two boys and you're going to love them. They are just going to be amazing in your kingdom. And when you get on your throne, hey, why don't you just have one on your left, one on your right? They're going to be great. And, and, and it's not like James and John are embarrassed right away. They're like, yeah, listen to her. Well, then the disciples just get indignant. They're like, who do you think you are and who do you think your mom is? Like, I think about this and I'm like, I think my mom likes me like that. How many of you got a mom who would just go to Jesus and be like, I like my boy? <laughs> my wife. She's like, yep. But, but this makes the disciples indignant. And, and Jesus uses the opportunity to give us a, a beautiful explanation of how power works in his kingdom. You see, it's interesting to note that Jesus doesn't tell the disciples in Matthew chapter 20 uh, how, how to, to not gain power. He, he doesn't say that you cannot be the greatest. He, he says how to be the greatest, though. It says this in verse 25, but Jesus called to them and said, hey guys, come here. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. You ever had anybody exercise authority over you? It's not that they're just over you, but they got to make sure you know that they're over you. Uh, that, that's, what they were, that's what they were learning. They wanted that. They thought that was power. I, want, I don't want just the title and the position. I want to be able to exercise authority over my, over my peers. The world is hungry for power. Verse 26 says, this is Jesus. He says, it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. See, what we discover through the way and the life of Jesus is that power is delegated in God's kingdom by demonstrating love to God's children. That's the greatest place in the kingdom of God. It's not being served, it's serving. You know, we, we as Christians, we, we like to see influence, and we should. We like to see impact, and we should. But unfortunately, because we're still wrestling with the flesh, oftentimes we can be given or delegated places of authority and, and power in God's kingdom, and we can kind of go, hey, look what God has done. And what we mean is, look at me. Look how great I am in God's kingdom. Look how much I'm over. But God's disposition towards power and our disposition as God's people should not be one that says, look what I'm over, but it should be, look what belongs to God. Not, look what God has given me, but look what God has done. Our job, friends, is to be undergirders of the very thing that God is doing in the earth. Not overlorders, but undergirders. Amen? Let us always be people who are stewards of the thing that belongs to God and never assume that influence or power or authority in God's kingdom is because of anything we've done. And let us never make the mistake that it belongs to us. Amen? Here's what I believe. Um, Simon Sinek says it this way. He's a, he's a leadership uh, speaker, if you've never heard of him, he says the truly effective and inspiring leaders aren't actually driven to lead people. They are driven to serve them. Isn't that, doesn't that sound like the heart of Jesus? 
Church, I want to encourage you that if, if you're struggling in your life today, if you're, if you're struggling to fit in, if, if you feel like your life is lacking impact and you, you feel like you're not getting traction, maybe you're looking for an, an opportunity in the church or outside of the church, I, I want to encourage you that if you'll commit yourself to serving God's children, you will find yourself thriving in God's kingdom. So Jesus wants to shape the way we see passions, power, and the last is this, and I'll close after this. Jesus wants to shape the way that you and I see people. And this is the most important aspect of this message. Verse 23 and 24 go on to say, and Jesus laid his hand on him and he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. And then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he opened his eyes and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Friends, Jesus really wanted this blind man to see, okay? Uh, He's not just giving us an illustration. The compassion and the healing power of the Lord is prophetic, but it's also his nature. He's not obligated to heal this man. He so desires to heal this man. But what, what... what I believe he's, he's doing is he's given this man a two-step healing, not because of the lack of his power. It, it wasn't difficult for Jesus to heal this man. But he gives this man an opportunity, and I believe he's giving us an opportunity to see people one of two ways. See, I don't know about you. I've never seen a tree walking. That's a strange thing to say. But I love the man's honesty to Jesus because he could have just said, wow, I mean, I haven't seen light in a long time. That's good enough. But the the engagement here of of the Lord doing a healing and the the mixture between his healing and and the honesty of the response, the man says, hey, look, I I can see, but I see people and they, they don't look like people. They look like trees walking. That honesty is beautiful, and it leads Jesus Jesus into the next moment of letting him see everything clearly. And and for us, I want to challenge you through this as an illustration. We can either see people as fuzzy and hardly there, or we we can choose to see people clearly, like Jesus sees people. I don't know about you, but have you ever have you ever walked in a room and and you just, you know, you're thinking about yourself and people are just kind of a, they're just a, they're a backdrop to what, what is going on with you. I've been there. But as the heart, and the character and the nature of God and the spirit of God capture my heart, what I pray is that the nature and the character of Jesus would so ignite love and kindness and presence in my life that people are not just blurry trees walking around, but they're the image of their creator. But friends, this doesn't just happen because you want it to. It happens because a miracle has to take place. You see, friends, the blind man wasn't going to see people clearly, and ultimately the blind man wasn't going to see everything clearly unless a miracle took place in his eyes. And friends, the eyes of our hearts today and every day need the miracle, need the enlightening miracle of the good news of Jesus to inflame our hearts on the inside so that the eyes of our hearts would truly see. And here's ultimately what I'm getting at. It's important for you and me and all of us as God's people to see people the way Jesus sees them. But what's more important is that you see Jesus the way that he sees you. Friends, do you know how Jesus sees you today? Do you know how much Jesus loves you today? Do you know the depths that Jesus has gone to? Not out of obligation, not because anybody begged him to, but scripture tells us that in love, our Savior went to the depths of existence to be with you and not just to be present there with you, but to rescue you out of darkness and transfer you into a life of light. 
You see, friends, when, when we capture how Jesus sees us and we get a glimpse of, of what it's like for, to see Jesus seeing us, we, we'll start to see everything clearly. And our lives will be an overflow of loving people the way that Jesus loves people. But today I want to end with, with a powerful illustration that hopefully will galvanize this moment in your heart. I, I heard a story, a tragic story, um, that happened uh, in the United States on the tail end of a flood. There was, there was a place where these boys used to go and play on the levee, and, and what happened was the levee was compromised, and the land around the levee had become like quicksand. And these boys got trapped in the quicksand. And, and I get emotional about it because I've got, I've got boys, and I, and I just have this image of the possibility of, of this taking place. And a search and rescue team, they, they go and look for them, and when they get to the site, finally, they see one of the brothers standing there in the sand, in the quicksand. And they're elated. The, the search and rescue people are elated to see him. But all of a sudden, panic strikes their hearts because they cannot, they, they don't see the other boy. And when they, they arrive on the scene, they're, they're like, you know, there's crying and there's emotion. But they, they, they see the, the younger brother and... And they go, where, where is your brother? And the boy, through tears and no words, he points and he says, I'm standing on his shoulders. I'm standing on his shoulders. That boy had sacrificed his life for his earthly brother to live in love what a powerful story but friends how much more is our eternal savior able to save us not just in this life but eternally we have that savior today who not only has forgiven us of all of our sin but has transferred his righteousness by faith to us. And if today we put our faith in Jesus, we don't just have our slates wiped clean, all of the righteousness of Christ is counted as ours. One life for another, death for life, an exchange for, for poverty, for wealth, not this life, but eternity. Let me read this last passage and I'll get off the platform. It says, verse 26, and he sent him home. But it says, send him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. Friends, today, Jesus is calling all of us home. For those of us that are believers, we know that we have an eternal home with him. But this, this, this is also speaking to a right now identity. Some of us have felt exiles in our own, in our own culture. We felt like exiles in our own state, in our own country. Some of us feel like exiles in our own skin because of emotional trauma and, and, and anxiety and depression and things that can plague us. Jesus is calling you home to be with him every day so that when you meet him face to face and you see him in glory, it's rejoicing because you've been there all along. And maybe there's someone in this room today and you've never felt at home. You've never felt at home with Jesus. Would you see him today as one who is not, he's not shaking you around. He's not overpowering you to get you to do something though his spirit is powerful and moving in your heart, and you sense it even right now, would you, if you've never been home with the Lord in your heart, would you today, would you be witness to his death for you? And not only his death, but his depth for you. He's gone to every length to save you. 
And would you see him as the victorious savior over your life? Hey, can I pray for you? And I'll hand the service back over to Pastor Scott. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your people, your word, and we thank you for the saving work and the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Holy Spirit, I pray that as people ponder your word, and even if they don't remember what is said, they would sense the move that you created in their hearts, God, and they would find their home in you. Lord, I pray that all of us today would nestle our passions in your purpose, Lord, and that we would um, see power the way that you see power, and we would, we would use the power you've given us for your glory, Lord, and ultimately we pray that we would see you the way you see us and see ourselves the way you see us and see people the way that you see people. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.